Hello, and welcome to the Canadian Story, where we discuss what Canada is, what Canada could be, and what Canada should be. And welcome to another episode of the Canadian Story. I'm very pleased to have an old frenemy. We've been on both sides of uh, many of political war as the internal party conservative and Wild Rose Alberta politics, but a man I respect deeply and who probably has a more in-depth knowledge of Alberta politics than maybe any other person in Alberta, uh, Vitor Marciano. Vitor, welcome to the show. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and uh, and being described as a friend of me, that's that's fun because I think we're friends, but there have been more than a few occasions where we've been enemies. So yes, it's, exactly. <laughs> it, it's a good fit. It's a good fit. That's politics, right? That's the that is essentially boiled down to what internal party politic political wars ha- do to you. A- absolutely, the the internal stuff is uh, is complicated and messy, and uh, and then you you hope everything sort of works out right, so you can do the external stuff, which is complicated and messy. And you hope everything works out right because hopefully you're doing it for the right reasons and it's going to be good for the country and good for people. And, you know, someday when you're 30 years older and you're wondering why I was in all those fights, you can say, well, you know, we did a little bit of good. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the at the end of the day, it's like not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Right. We're not we're never going to get it totally right. But at least everyone and I, I know this is true of you. I know it's true of me. We think what we're doing is for the better of the country. Totally. And we don't always agree on what that is, but that's okay. <laughs> well, and, and it's a complicated thing because it's all about people. Yes. Um, I, I've told more than one, you know, elected official that, you know, cause sometimes people, when they become elected officials, they think politics is about policy and about ideas. <laughs> and it's like, no, 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 no. Politics is about getting real live human beings to implement your ideas the way you would implement them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Given the fact that you don't know everything that's going on and they may not agree with you. And yeah, yeah. It, so it's, it's, it's got layers of humanity and uh, you know, it's, it's way more of an art than a science and it's way more, it's way closer to the humanities. than the the, It is the most human occupation. I feel like that this and religion, right? It's like my mom always said, I hope you don't become a pastor. And then I ended up getting into politics and she's like, Oh boy. <laughs> you know, you know, you're totally right. Because I hadn't thought about it that way, but just like politicians or just like pastors, either one of them brings all of their human foibles and frailties and personality flaws and strengths and weaknesses into the job. And it's just, that's how it is. That's how, you know, there are human beings doing a complicated job and they walked in with a whole bunch of character flaws and a whole bunch of character strengths. And hopefully they can find the mix of the two things to work and, achieve something well and, and you've you've been very close with a lot of senior alberta politicians um you've also been demonized by large groups of the wild rose base for a while i've been demonized by conservative party based people uh a friend of mine once said you're not a real political operative unless people you don't even know have things to say about you <laughs> totally <laughs> uh and, and 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 in politics y'all get that where it's sort of like I don't think I've ever met them. I'm pretty sure I've never talked to them. If I've crossed them, I have no idea how or why. Well, it, it's but like they don't, they don't like hate you as a person, right? It's the idea of you now. You you've become. It's like it's like in Batman, right? It's like before we kill Batman, we have to kill the symbol of Batman, right? It's like you become a symbol more than a person. And people <laughs> people did that with Walid Solomon too, right? They like he wants Sharia law, and they spread it all over the freaking country, and he has no desire to implement Sharia law, but it became like this meme that spread like freaking virus. Right. And and it was hard to contain. Well, and that'll happen. Like um, people project so much of what they want into politics that, that they stop being reasonable. And, and then the other part about politics that's weird is you kind of get three levels of people getting into politics. You get the, absolutely wonderful people. They're absolutely brilliant. They're absolutely wonderful. They're thoughtful. They're self-aware. They're wonderful. And, and they want to be in politics and you want them to be in politics. And they're about a third of politicians. And then you get the absolutely normal people. Um, and they're completely normal. They go strengths and weaknesses and they're normal. They're not spectacularly talented or spectacularly insightful. They want to make a difference. But they want to make a difference. They've got good normalness. And you also want them to be in politics. 
And then there's another third that can look absolutely brilliant or look absolutely normal. And they come across as one of those two. And it takes a little while for you to figure out that, ooh, they're kind of a little bit sociopathic. Yeah, yeah. This is about power for them. <laughs> yeah. And and they're not nice and and they're not normal and their flaws are way bigger than their strengths. And they kiss up and kick down. But, but, their, but their strength is hiding their weaknesses. Totally. And so, you know, those ones, it, sometimes it can take years to figure them out. And those ones, you kind of hope they leave politics and go away. But politics is also sort of set up so that some of those people, if they're, if they're kind of talented, they can go a long way. And they can go all the way. Look at, uh, look at the current prime minister, arguably. Yeah. Or, Yeah. Or some of the people around him. I mean, yep. it's 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 a. Uh, I, I haven't made up my mind yet on on the level of talent of the current prime minister. I think he's way more talented than his enemies give him credit for. I don't think he's anywhere near as talented as his supporters say he is. But I haven't. I haven't quite figured out the pieces yet on, on, on that stuff. I think he's a relatively unsuccessful prime minister, and that history will look back at him harshly. But he's been a very successful prime minister politically. He's, and I think not, that's what he cares about. I think this is about proving something to his dad that he's not just a frat boy, that he has what it takes. If he wins one more, he has almost as much time as his dad did. He's in the pantheon of the top ten, and he's like, "I did it. I'm a political mastermind." Like, and I did that, it my way, and it was I did it my than, way. I didn't it do it the way than, my dad would have done it. Totally, you know. Uh, Say what you will about Pierre, he was a, a deep intellect, a talented writer. Uh, there were things that that he could do. There were there were talent sets in Pierre Trudeau that I do not see any signs of in Justin Trudeau. Yeah, but, but I think Justin's talents are different. I think one of the things we've talked about this on a phone call, but I wanted to bring it up is he is incredibly good at the fear-based divisive politics, maybe even a master, right? Like he has a large portion of the Muslim community in this country convinced that people like you and I don't like them. And I, all I could say is salam Habibi. Like, I love you. <laughs> right? Come be he, conservatives. You are my brothers. He is so good at wedging groups and at playing to fears and at appearing to care. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating thing. And, and he's, I, I think I see through it. Uh, I find parts of it difficult to tolerate. I mean, his loud whisper that shows how much he cares kind of bugs me the wrong way, but it's, it's working. I, you know, uh, you have to give him props, like for all of the attacks that he's received and he's, he's had the full, you know, all the clips unloaded on him. This guy is this guy's a survivor. He's a fighter. At the end of the day, what he is is persistent. And yeah. I think about that a lot, right? Talent and genius are not enough. Persistence, Calvin Coolidge said, is what will de determine the boys from the men. And he's got it. Um, yeah. As much as I don't like, I don't like his policies. I think he's really hurting our home province to a point of maybe destroying the country that I love. But I'll give him props. He's uh, he's a fighter, and he's been relatively successful so far. So we'll see. Yes. We'll see what comes of that. Um, speaking on that point, it's I'd like your perspective on we've had Derek Feldebrandt on and we've had a few other people, uh, Garnet Jenis, on to kind of talk about the issue in Alberta. Uh, there's obviously a wide variety of perspectives, but uh, we kind of consider these our airing of grievances episodes. So it's a little <laughs> bit different than uh, it's trying to help other Canadians understand that there's a real problem here that needs to be solved. But it is not an impossible problem. It's just a puzzle like a chess puzzle or we can fix this problem if we make the right moves. Yes. And this entire issue is kind of complicated for me in the sense that I'm kind of a Canadian by choice. Uh, you know, it was my parents' choice, but in some ways mine. Uh, my, my parents came over to Canada when I was four in the mid 70s. Um, unlike a whole bunch of people who rush to immediately become citizens so that they can get the uh, the passport. Uh, my parents actually took a little while to decide to become Canadian citizens. So uh, we were here for, for almost over 10 years. So my parents and I became Canadian citizens on September 4th, 1984. My, uh, I love my mom it. And dad, Five years before I was born. Yeah, well, <laughs> my mom and dad did the oath. I was standing beside them as a young kid and did the oath. And then we, you know, then we went and voted because that was election day. 
Oh, wow. That, that is a cool story. So Brian Mulrooney, like my, my parents voted, uh, we, at the time we were living in what I think was Edmonton East. So they, they went out and voted for Bill Lessick. Um, and, uh, you know, in many ways, I'm, I'm a Canadian by choice. There's a lot of things I love about Canada, but I'm also a weird Canadian because I'm an immigrant Canadian who's spent almost his entire life in Alberta. And the immigrant Canadian experience in Alberta is different than the immigrant Canadian experience in other parts of the country. Yes. And you, you end up with them. Um, you, you, you know, the, the, the things you really like about the Canadian immigrant experience over time, you discover that they're not universal to Canada. So, you know, with the exception of about nine months when I lived in, in Toronto in, again, in the late eighties, um, I've been in Edmonton all my life and it's, it's very, very different. And as you, you know, having grown up in Alberta, having formed up in Alberta, having, you know, done my, my, uh, my university in Alberta, having, you know, bought my first house and lived my career and had my kids and gotten married in Alberta, you end up with a, a perspective of, of, of Alberta that is in some way stronger than Canada. And. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I'm growing up in Alberta myself, right. Being born there. Uh, raised there and then doing a lot of politics there over the years. It is not the same experience as an Ontarian. Like you have a pride in your province that is deep and powerful. There's a, there is an Alberta nationalism and it's a civic nationalism. Yeah. And, and you've done it. I mean, you've actually worked full time in Ottawa. Um, my first sort of experience at this at the national level was I got elected onto the the first uh, National Council of the Conservative Party of Canada in 2005. And for four years, five years, I would routinely fly out to Ottawa for meetings with a national council of Canadians from all over the country and 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 the political staff and, and political people in Ottawa. And you you quickly realize, huh, we're different in Alberta. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and then you have to decide what to do about that differentness. And you have to decide what to do about that differentness within the context of the conservative party of Canada. And, and then within the context of trying to set national policy and, and trying to influence the political success on what we can do going forward. And, and you kind of, you know, that first conservative party, Canada national council, we kind of wanted to hold the country together. We wanted to be national. Because but we, we had spent same- so much time with the reform and the, the Canadian Alliance and and then even the first iteration of the Conservative Party in 2004 that lost. And it was like, we were so tired of losing. We were so tired of it. And and you had to find a way to keep a balance of this and, you know, put enough water in your wine that maybe you could win, not put so much water in your wine that you couldn't stomach what you had to drink. Uh, and And it was complicated. And you you try to understand all of it and in 2010 i kind of gave that all up and came back to work just for wild rose and uh, and i remember having I'd, I'd briefed somebody in the prime minister's office about the political situation in alberta and I, I described it as alberta had two parties at the time a party that had been governing for a long time and was set up to fail because it had just been in governing for too long and then a new brand new party that that was coming up but was kind of built to fail Right, right. So true. Because <laughs> there were things about it that were just not right. And they, they were going to be offside with Albertans. They were offside with good management practice. They were just offside. And then sort of saying, can we actually see a circumstance where um, we go into an election and, you know, the PCs are failing because they're an old failing party. The Wild Rose is built to fail because they're an old failing party. And voters decide that, oh, oh crap, I'm going to vote for whichever one of my local candidates has the best resume. And, and one of the things that I warned Ottawa about at the time was in most elections, if you just go read the resumes, the liberal candidate has the best resume. Yeah. And, and they're, they're like, what, what do you mean? I said, well, it's, it's the structure of the liberal party of Canada. Lots of people run for the liberal party of Canada, not because they hope they will win. It's actually because they hope they will lose. Right. The because most then they're, valuable in, letters- they're in the inner circle. Yeah, the most valuable letters traditionally in Canadian history have been DLC, defeated Liberal candidate. Really? The Liberal, Party, the Liberal Party of Canada has been so good over the years at looking after their defeated Liberal candidates 
that there are a lot of people who would much rather be a defeated liberal candidate than an elected liberal MP. I did not know this. I did not know this. Oh, yeah. I, you, you want to become a judge? Doesn't, right. Doesn't hurt. Right. You want to get appointed to an important board uh, at a national level in the area of your industry as an MD or any other sort of specialist? Being a DLC? Damn good. Well, and, and, and this is something that the Conservative Party has never been able to figure out is – tribes that take care of their own succeed and the conservatives we don't take care of our own we eat our own we shoot our wounded if someone's lying in the street we pull out the gun and we just t- end their misery you remember that time when you crossed me that you don't actually remember now i'm getting even worse. <laughs> yeah you're dead now you're dead <laughs> um, and I, I remember telling them at the time that you know we could end up with a crazy weird election where the liberals end up doing really well or something completely untoward happens and and ultimately, when Daniel Smith asked me to get involved, I got involved for that reason. And it's funny because I think I was a little bit prophetic. I didn't know that that election was going to come in 2015. Where I'm yeah, going, we're going but to it came, but it came. Hold their nose and vote NDP. And yeah. and 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 the funny part is they 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 voted NDP. In my personal opinion, they voted NDP for the exact same reason that I predicted. It got to the stage where they said, "We will not elect the PCs again, no matter what." And when the PCs and the media convinced them that the PCs were going to win 52 seats. All across Alberta, a whole bunch of people said, they ain't winning this one. Yeah, yep, yep. And they won the Red Deers. How yeah. nuts is that? The yeah. Red Deers. But it, but but that wasn't that wasn't people voting for the NDP. That was people saying, where is my vote most likely to defeat the PCs? Yes. And yes. Th- you never want to you never want to get the public so angry that they do something crazy. And and I'm going to bring that all the way back to where you started with the question. You never want to get the public so angry that they'll do something crazy. Well, damn it, the rest of Canada is working really hard on trying to get Albertans angry enough to do something crazy. Oh, and and it's it's the mockery, the mockery that we receive from the Eastern elite, uh, particularly the media. It's like, I loved what uh, Derek had to say when he came on, but he said, it's like you give a guy a loan, you just give a guy 10,000 cash, and then he comes and pisses on your y- yard all the time. Like, come on, buddy. <laughs> At least don't piss on our yard. It, it's, it, it's actually even worse than that, in my opinion. It, the rest of Canada is an abusive husband. Yes, yes. It, it's like their line is, you like the beatings. You, you'll never have it so good. You don't know where else you're going to go. You got it good. Just sit there Shut and take up. it. Just take it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that might sound like an exaggeration, and it is an exaggeration, but but it's symbolic of the underlying attitude of saying, instead of saying, well, let me understand why you're upset. Let me try to make sense of, of what I'm doing that's making you upset or what you think is unfair. The response is, yeah, I've heard you already. You're wrong. And you're just going to have to take it and live with it because you're because never we're bigger and stronger than you because we're bigger than stronger than you. Yeah, we're bigger and stronger than you. You'll never have it better than you have it right now. Every other option is worse for you. You can't leave. And there's a tremendous risk in going down that path. I mean, you want to take it all the way back to Milton, you know, Paradise Lost. Uh, Satan was the most powerful angel in heaven but he chose to reign in hell than serve in heaven. And and there are a lot of Albertans, including sometimes myself. Obviously, I've started this project because I want to be on the other side of saying, hey, Canada, stop hurting your, your wife or she's going to leave you. Like you need to get on your knees and beg for forgiveness and repent and turn around and go the other way and start living better. Because honestly, if, I don't want Albertans to have to stay in Canada if this continues. Well, and and you don't even have to be as harsh as you've been about it. Heck, if you don't want to get down on your knees and beg, why don't you at least sit at the table and listen carefully? Right, right. Um, You know, I've been married for 30 years. And, uh, oh, probably, you know, 15 years ago, I was in an argument with my wife where – she got really angry at me. Can't even remember what it's about, but she said something magical. You know, I was trying to explain myself logically and she's like, I don't care about your logic. I care about the fact, you know, that I'm angry right now and you're not paying attention to the fact that I'm angry right now. 
Oh, wow. Don't, don't try to, don't try to explain it away to me. Just listen and accept and try to understand why I'm angry. And, you know, you know, my arguments were not conducive to solving that fight. I had to sit and listen for a little while for that. Um, that's available to us as a country still. Um, but man, you know, the elites in this country, uh, you know, the, 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 the opinion leaders, the media writers, the academics, the, the, the chattering classes, none of them care. And well, or at and least they're trying to create the, the impression they don't care. The status quo is so good for them right now that they're like any change. If we if we change anything, it might it might not be quite as good. It's it's a scarcity versus abundance mindset. One of the things I love about Albertans is they have an abundance mindset towards life. They're like, no, if we all work hard and pull together, we can we can do amazing things. And we did the miracle on the prairies. That's us. Alberta is the miracle on the prairies. <laughs> And it's old, like this is deeply rooted. So in the, in the twenties and the thirties, they talked about how Alberta was tomorrow's country. And that was because people could tolerate a horrible year and say, yeah, it'll be better next year. Yeah. And yeah. They're, 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 we're going we're to grit it out and wait for next year and it'll be better next year. And that there's this fundamental optimism. There's this fundamental choice to work hard. And this, I mean, this is something. In that some ways, of- I think Alberta is the most Canadian province. And I, and I, only, I, I obviously I'm biased and Quebecers will think theirs is and Ontarians will think theirs is. But the truth of the matter is we are the ones that still hold the spirit of the people who came here. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. It's the um, that pioneer spirit that we will carve it out and work hard to make it happen. We'll, we'll, we'll create it. That exists in Alberta more than it exists in other parts of the country. Well, you don't move to Alberta if you want an easy life. No, you move to Alberta because you want to work. Yes, <laughs> because nobody, nobody goes to live. I mean, Banff is beautiful and there's great skiing and all. It's a beautiful place. I'm, I don't want to take away from the absolutely majestic natural beauty of but it gets cold in a cold in a way that nobody else could really understand. Albertans who can afford it don't retire to Alberta. Yeah, exactly. as a general rule. Um, <laughs> but they come to Alberta to, to achieve something and, and, and they want to work and when 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 the federal government says we're going to phase out your top industry and find ways to look after you, they don't understand that that's insulting because no Albertan showed up to be looked after. Yeah, yeah. They, they showed up to look after themselves, and the the the, the, the portrayal of um, yeah, don't worry, we, we'll take care of you, we'll transition you. It's not like no, you're, that's not you're the not, Alberta you, way. The Alberta way is I'll transition myself. Yeah, yeah. Don't. There are no verbs you're going to do to me. That's yes, not, yes. I'm that's, my own master. That's not how it works here. And and this is that attitude used to be more prevalent in in all of Canada. You know, um, it it's moved and changed a little bit. Uh, I think it's still very prevalent in the Lebanese community, in Ottawa, in the Sikh community, in Surrey or Abbotsford, there are a lot of immigrant communities that embody this idea to the same degree that Alberta does. Like they just grind it out and they get successful. Like the most successful people I know right now, mo- almost half of them are second generation immigrants. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's something, there is absolutely something to that. And, and people who live on the land. Yes. The rural folk. Yeah. The, and, 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 yeah. I don't. I, I don't like saying it that way. Like you just said it as the rural folk. Um, I think I, I say that as, as a rural folk, right? I grew, I, the town I grew up in that we we're fourteen people. Or there's fourteen yeah. houses, right? Yeah, but the problem with saying it that way is that people in the cities don't understand it that way. And and maybe the the correct way to say it, um, there, there's this British thinker who's who's headed down this path, is to talk about that these are people who are connected to their communities that their that their lives revolve around a specific place summer. a place it's a place they, and and the place is what provides them their livelihood they're they're in you know they're in a primary industry so therefore you you, you can't export their livelihood to another place because the place is about their livelihood and their lifestyle choices and their living choices are attached to that place and they recognize because invariably, if you're in one of those places or if you're in one of those lifestyles, work is involved in it. Yes, you like know, real work. 
not like not no. mental work. I'm talking physical labor. I'm talking. I, I just got a, a bit brand new uh, Siberian Husky, and I have to keep picking her up and doing all this stuff. And I'm constantly moving in a way that I haven't moved as much in in years. And all these office jobs, and I'm shedding weight. And I'm like, oh, this is what I was meant to do. Physical. Like I'm a human. I need to be moving and acting in the world. Yep. Yep. And and there's there there there's absolutely something to that. Uh, and that. You know, the work will occasionally require you to take a shower after you're done work. Yes. yes. Um, that attitude rewires the brain a little bit. Well, you have a strength. So just this last fall after the leadership race was finally done, I was like, I need a break, but I don't want to make no money during my break. So I was like, I'm going to go clean eaves troughs with, for my cousin's company. <laughs> And so for a month, I just went up on the roofs and dug leaves out of gutters. And I have not been happier in a long time than up on those roofs. Because that was how I, how I used to make my money to pay for university. And and uh, just going up there and there's something so empowering and confidence building about doing physical labor. I I, I love that you say it because I've actually experienced that a few times in my life where, you know, I'm. I'm either at a political setback or at at a point where I really need to understand, like I need to clear my head and 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 reapproach a situation that's become difficult to make sense of. And you know, I can think of one in in one case, I I ordered uh, like three yards of two inch uh, pea gravel to get dumped in front of my house, and then wheelbarrowed it and shoveled it. And you know, laid it out beside my house in, in in a in a rain terrace that I needed to get taken care of, and the physical act of shoveling wheelbarrows gravel. full of, yeah. of, of 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 gravel, as exhausting as it was, and I'm I'm an old man now and not capable of doing the physical labor I could as a kid. It was so absolutely wonderful. <laughs> oh, and and it's different than working out at a gym. People have to understand this because you're actually achieving a, an objective. You're yeah. building something, or like you said, you're you're landscaping, or in my case, you're cleaning leaves out of gutters so they don't overflow. You're actually doing something of real human and personal value. <laughs> we're as a species, I think we're kind of wired to value that. But I do think I do think that if you spend too much time away from that, you it changes your brain. Now you become, you, know, less and maybe, you become less human. Like I'm talking like the animal human, right? Because because yeah. we have there's a marriage between this this mind, spirit, and body, right? And if the body is is left to kind of decay, the mind will still keep going, but it just even it even it won't work as well. Yeah. There's I, I think there's something to that. And and now maybe it's because you know we're both from relative working class roots. Yeah. That we think yes. that way. And you know uh, I work really hard to actually inculcate that spirit in, in my daughter. So, you know, um, I got a 14 year old, uh, when she was five or six, we, we put her in riding lessons, not because we wanted to be hoity or anything, but we thought, you know, horse manure and shoveling out a stall are good for the soul. Very. That's my, my first job. That was my first job was there's a horse training facility near my parent, my parents house I was uh, I was 11 or 12 years old six in the morning my dad would get up with me and my brother my brother was eight and I was 10 and we would go and muck stalls for, for three hours and then you know we're we get home at nine to start school and we've already worked for three hours we were making eight dollars an hour <laughs> yep and we wanted to make sure that our daughter kind of got this um you know my daughter's sort of an interesting creature on my side she's first generation Canadian yeah right on her mom's side, she's sixth generation Albertan. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, and I was like, and, and her mom, who's a country girl from, from Kelsey, Alberta, out in the middle of nowhere, you know, nobody knows where Kelsey is. It's near Balf. Most people don't know where Balf is. It, it's, you know, it's not quite the middle of nowhere, but it's getting close. Uh, you know, my wife wanted to make sure that our daughter had some connection to the land. And, yes. Yes. Uh, so. That, that, that's that's how we started course riding. Sixth generation Albertan. I'm only a first generation Albertan, but I'm a, I think an eighth generation Canadian. So oh, uh, it's it it it's actually really cool, and it's you know there's there are members of my wife's 
maternal family that came here in the 1870s. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, Zach and I, one of our ancestors was the first white man born this side of the Grand River. Wow. Yeah. Like, uh, cool. so the first settler, like, came yeah. into the bush and started tearing, cutting it down the trees and pulling the stumps out and, and, you know, eventually being able to plow the land, right? Yeah. Uh, you, but yeah. You know, this connection to a time and a place, this connection to, to a different type of lifestyle, I, I'm, I'm hoping to inculcate that in my kid. I'm hoping more Canadians spend time thinking about it. I think if people thought about it, it probably has a little bit of an impact on their politics. Um, you know, it, it's got to get you past the, everything will come from the government. It'll all arrive over the internet. Uh, your, your, your food will arrive in styrofoam sealed in plastic. You won't cook anymore. You're not going to have meals with your friends where this, this COVID time is super weird, man, because it's making us all really good consumers. We can still buy all our things online. We can still order our food. None of the, our buying, our buying ability hasn't changed that much. It's changed in the hospitality industry primarily, but what has changed is we're not social animals anymore. What? We are the, that is what we are. We're, we're chimpanzees. Like, it, yes, maybe we're also spiritual beings and all that, but like, we know that we're pack animals and without social development, we, we stagnate. Well, and technology and communications and the ability to make us all afraid and tell us all about these problems have helped us muddle through for a while on this, but, you know, we're now going into the, you know, the, the first real February of this, remember it, it really only started mid March last year. Yeah, you know yeah. So we're about to go through the darkest month of the year living this again. And then we're going to go into March living this again. And if I, I live in, in, in some significant fear that if we don't, feel like there's light at the end of the rainbow uh the population generally is going to get really angry and cranky well we're already witnessing that i don't know if you've been following this gm squeeze at all and what's happening with it but like the rage that is starting it's boiling over and i i said on uh on my on my facebook post i said you know the tea party was a warning right um there's the Black Lives Matter was like this, the, the fuse has been lit, you know, um, and now GME is basically the explosion. Like they're, they're, they're willing to burn down the Institute. People are willing to burn down their own money. Now high amount, like large amounts that we're talking like 50% of their net worth. They're willing to just burn it on a pile on a pyre because that's how much they hate the elites now. Yeah. And this is, this is America. Trump, Trump is the embodiment of that hate and anger from America. Now he has other positive qualities, but he rode that to power. Right. And what I, what I've always said is thank God it was Trump. Imagine if it was someone who was a good communicator. <laughs> yeah. With message discipline and talent. Oh, and that would, that would be Hitler. You yeah, could do and, it. And, you could do it. And, and, it, and if they, and if it had been somebody who had as much ill intent as they assumed that Trump did. Oh, exactly. He, he, I, think, I don't think he had very, very much ill intent at all. I think he actually did want to make America great. He, and, and Trump is in many ways a clown, in many ways a parody <laughs> of himself, a, a handful of good instincts, uh, a handful of very defective personality traits, um, an inability to operationalize where he wanted to go, uh, and yet still did remarkably well considering the handful of good instincts and, and it was chaotic and it created a chaos and, and all of the people who should have said, Hmm, that chaos showed up a little faster and easier than we thought. Maybe we need to listen. They blamed it all on Trump. They're like, Oh, it's just Trump. Trump is the problem. No, Trump isn't the problem. Trump is the symptom of the problem. So it, it'll be interesting to see where, where this all comes from. I mean, or where where it comes from, I get. I think I think there's more and more people feeling disconnected from the elites. There are more and more people coming to the conclusion that that the elites, the chattering classes, the the the, the, the people who make the decisions in our world don't care about them. And the, the brutal part that, that, that I don't think the chattering classes understand is that that disconnected community is starting to exist on the left and on the right. Yes. 
and and in big numbers and that's what that's what gme is this is why i say it's such a historically significant moment because it's the communists and the trump supporters united to take down big finance and when that happens like what people don't understand is that the one of the only remaining major advantages that the west has is our financial system like without the without our our very complex system businesses would not be started as fast as they are like what we've created is a is an environment where you know you you can take your shot in the west you can still take your shot for example yep. i've i'm starting three startups people are starting startups in the west all the time silicon valley popped out of nowhere and created trillions of dollars of wealth this is the advantage of the west but that advantage will be taken away if the corrupt politicians and oligarchs continue to allow inequality to rise because inequality historically every single time inequality gets to a certain point revolution every single time well and it's a combination of things it's not just inequality it's inequality and then select so, so for some groups the inequality is what drives their anger and for other groups the you're going to take away my opportunity to climb out of my inequality is what takes away their anger and then they're kind of doing both it's 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 kind of a bizarre thing and and it's almost like the thinkers have doubled down on it. When you get to this Build Back Better, the Great Reset, the Great Transformation, Green New Deal, some of the things they're talking about, some of the ways they're framing it, they've missed the point. You know, putting out a little... Well, a video. lot of these elites, like a lot of these academic-minded, policy-oriented people, they think they're kind of gods. They're like, well, we know what's right for the people. And the people don't know those stupid people like the way they talk about regular people. If, if you have a real job where you get your hands dirty, you are actually thought less of. Uh, I don't know people. if you've ever read Frank, uh, Frank Hebert and, and Dune. Like no, the, it's one of my favorite okay. series of all time. So in, in one of them, he, he always has the little quotes at the beginning of chapters that, that he ascribes to characters in his books. And there's a spectacular one. I think it's in God Emperor of Dune where it's supposedly the God Leto is talking and he says, um, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it's essentially all liberals are closet aristocrats. Yes, yes. They, they, they're deeply convinced that they could live your life better than you do, and if and you let them live your life, they could help you lead your life better than they than than yeah. you do. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's but it, it, it's both. Like it's like if if I had your life, I'd do it better. If if you let me lead you in your life, you'll do better. And and there's this sense there that they're trying to create, and they they don't understand human nature and they don't understand some incentives. of the forces. They don't understand incentives. Yeah. Well, th there's this crazy thing in a video that, um, that uh, the world economic forum put out, you know, that by 2030, we won't own anything. Anything we want will rent and it'll be delivered by drones and we'll be happy. No, <laughs> I won't be happy. You, you take my land from my cold, dead hands. <laughs> well, and even if it isn't land, it's almost like, Go back and read the Bible. Yeah. Because uh, one of the, the sins that we're, as human beings, to try to avoid in the Ten Commandments is covetedness. We covet things. Do you actually think you're going to get rid of human humans wanting to covet things, to own things, to have things? No. These guys think they that they can. They can create a world where they'll solve that problem and deliver it by drones and it's like, no, 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 that's just not going to happen. Well, it would and, be if, if they really were trying to solve that pro problem in an honest way, I would say, okay, you know, I believe they have good intentions. But all you have to do is look at their actions, and they are not interested at all in solving this problem. They are interested in enriching themselves on the lie that they're going to. Well, let's put it this way. Even if I, even if I believe they had good intentions, I'd still be deeply concerned about it because the road to hell is paved with good intent. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, uh, everybody who's been absolutely horrible in the history of humanity has always claimed to have good intentions. And some of them may actually have deeply believed it inside their own heads. Oh, I think the really truly evil people do. They never believe they're the bad guy. <laughs> Are we the baddies? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's like that. Canada can, I honestly believe Canada's got a shot at avoiding all of this. But it's got a shot. If you're asking me, do I believe it will? You don't. I know. No, yeah, you've told me that. No, yeah. I, 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 I honestly think 
I honestly think that as Alberta pushes Canada's buttons, Canada is going to tell Alberta to get lost. And then Alberta will leave. And then Alberta will leave. And, and here's the funny part that I don't think Canada understands. It goes all the way back to, to, to Milton and Paradise Lost. A spurned, angry Alberta that has chosen to leave because he can't get treated properly by Canada. Will will perform at a high level unseen in the world. This is going to be Singapore. This is going to be and, Hong Kong. And more than that, will be mean and vindictive to Canada in ways that Canada can't begin to imagine. Um, as a landlocked province within Canada, there's nothing Alberta can do. As a landlocked country or whatever model we end up taking, slightly outside of Canada, we can, we can ability, cause all kinds of havoc. Our ability to mess with Canada is almost unlimited. And Canada is more fragile than Alberta. Than Alberta. And Canada is more fragile than the Laurentian elites think it is. Well, and they've always thought that it was fragile on the Quebec side, which it is, but they've never realized that all of this time they were building up resentment and bitterness and grievances with a place they didn't even care about. Honestly, people don't like Zach and I've talked about this. People in Ontario don't even think about Alberta. It's, it's, it's a sin. It's the sin of neglect. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that's, it's probably fair. It's probably fair. I mean, one of the things I used to say on national council was, um, it wasn't Alberta's job to accommodate the rest of the country. It was our job to to def, to redefine where the middle position was. Yeah. Occasionally we accommodated, but more often than not, uh, you know, the Alberta members of National Council were sort of pushing. And if we stretched the margin, the, the place where the middle fell moved. Yes. And, and hopefully we could get this, you know, get the middle to move more in the direction of of where we needed it to be. Um, you you'd accommodate when you needed to accommodate to win because it's a political party that's built around winning. But if you kept stretching and moving the middle, then, then hopefully what, what everybody else thought was normal kept shifting in your direction. And, and that was a useful thing. Um, but that was inside the conservative party of Canada. Yeah. 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 The, the right wing party. Yeah. And you, we still had to stretch and move and, and try to shift the middle. The elites in this country think that the, left edge of the Conservative Party of Canada is un-Canadian. Yeah, yeah. Um, the lib- to, to be Canadian in the minds of the Liberal Party is to be liberal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They, they are Canada. And, and in the minds of huge chunks of Canadian opinion makers and, and elites and, and chattering classes, to be Canadian is to be just a little bit to the left of the Of liberal. America. Like if, if you if you can if if you can be a liberal NDP switcher who's disappointed by blue liberals, you're Canadian. That's, yeah. that's where Canadians are. Yeah, yeah. And but it's not where Canadians are. And this is the funniest thing. It's not even where Ontarians are. The problem is that that um, immigrants have been fed a lot of propaganda on the conservative party claiming that the conservative party hates them and wants to hurt them. And we made some mistakes along the way that they, they used as fodder for that story. Um, and I just want to say to all of the, I mean, we've had a bunch of immigrants on already. You're a first generation immigrant. I, I mean, Canada is a nation of immigrants. The conservative party loves immigrants. We would, we would love nothing more than to have more high quality Canadians come and move to this country and become Canadian. I can't even imagine. We are the only conservative party in the entire Western world that is so pro-immigration. Oh, easily. Yeah. Yeah. Like, easily. And we are like, it's, it's settled. There's no, there's no real debate on it. There's a little, there's some grumpy people and like Senator Husak has put it really well when he said, and what they're afraid of isn't that they're racist. It's they're afraid of the unknown. They're afraid of the, the of something different. I, I would disagree with that. I think the ones who are cranky and a little dubious are afraid of being grifted. Oh, right. Right. You know, they, they, they kind of look at this and they say, you know, why are there only 36, 37 million Canadians or 37? Yeah. It's around 37 million Canadians, but 45 or 46 million valid social insurance numbers. 
Yep. Yep. Yeah. You know, so so th- th- they're not anti-immigrant, but they are probably anti. Um, Being taken advantage of. of. They don't want to be taken advantage of. Totally. Yeah. And, well, and, and we shouldn't be. The fact that we are being, I mean, basically, we're like the sugar daddy for, you know, five million people. Yeah. I, yeah. And, yeah. and it, it's an issue. Now, having said that, having said all of that, we might be a year or two away from benefiting from that in a spectacular way because we're probably not too far away from having three or 400,000 incredibly hardworking, incredibly talented people from Hong Kong, leave, leave Hong Kong. Yes. Oh, that's going to be so good for our country. It's going to be amazing. I'm, I mean, I'm so sad for Hong Kong, but I'm so happy for Canada. And, and, and they're going to turn to, to uh, our, banana left the build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything else and say what are you talking about yeah, you know where we're from a little island that we turned into an empire now we have a now we have a nation oh yeah all of anyone from hong kong listening come come we will take you we have enough space for every one of you every single one of you can move here <laughs> and, and in some ways they'll change us so that all yeah. of that is is interesting stuff and and even a positive experience that way may may make a whole bunch of Canadians say, "All right, well, you know, sometimes this you know overly generous nature of 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 creating quick Canadians might help us." Now, I have to tell you, I'm a little bit on the harsher edge of that group than than the average Canadian. Um, when I came to Canada, you had to be here for five years and actively Canadian before you could apply to become a citizen. Um, like I said, my parents didn't rush to it. They were very deliberate about it. We took 10 years to decide yeah, to do it. Yeah. Nowadays, it's three years and you don't really have to be in the country. Yeah, we need to we need reform on those things. But I I, I mean, there's there's probably a billion people in this world that would like to come live here. We get yeah. to pick, right? And we should be picky. We should say, we want, world, give us your best and your brightest. You know what? That's what Canada wants. That's what Rome was. Rome was not a a race or a, even a religion it was an idea and the idea of rome was this merit matters and only the most meritorious should rule and so they fought like a king of the hill and they would they would people would fall off all the time and this is what i love about alberta albertan politics particularly it is a blood sport you do not survive in my home province's politics for very long if you aren't a killer i i don't completely agree with that you could actually survive a fair a fair amount of time being really nice, but not if you want to go all the way to the top. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I, and that's what I mean. Like yeah. if, the top, yeah. if, if, if you're ambitious, it's, it's, it's a tough, tough place. It's a tough place. Don't deny that for a second. But that's um, good. It makes tough men <laughs> and yeah. women and women. Oh yeah. yeah and women and like Danielle Smith. Uh, the first war room I was in was with you with that Danielle Smith campaign in 2012 when I was doing event planning. And I remember just being in awe of her. Like being like, this is a communication masterpiece. She could deliver messages. And one of them, she was one of the best people to deliver messages I've ever encountered in politics. I have never met anybody who was as quick a study of policy as she was and her ability to convey policy like that, that, that ability to write. If anything, it it became a little frustrating sometimes because you could, if you ask Danielle Smith a question, every question, if you let her would be answered in a 600 word call. Yes, yes. Off well, the top of her hat. Right. And right. it was like, Danielle, 100 words, please. 100 yeah, words. Yeah. Well, Too many people endings. don't want to read your 600 word call. <laughs> <laughs> Too many endings. Uh, but, but, but she's really talented that way. But, but that was her strength. She, I'd like to have you on again to just talk about that campaign because, <laughs> A, because it's just a fond memory for me, but you had so much more information oh, about it too. It, it was a crazy one. I'd, I'd love to chat about it. I, I have a, a personal non-standard theory about what happened in that final weekend that I think is different. And I think all- people would, en- I think people would enjoy hearing that. Unfortunately uh, we have to end here, but uh, we're definitely going to have you back on. Thank you for coming. And uh, I guess, do you have any last message you'd like to leave the listeners with? Uh, yeah. You know, as much as I have my doubts about Canada, I'm still really hopeful about it as well. And I want to tell, cause I'm hoping people across the country get to hear this. And I want to highlight the one thing that I think is amazing about Canada relative to anywhere else in the world. If you're young and you're interested in politics, Canada is the last place in the world where you can get involved in politics as a volunteer. 
and based on nothing but your hard work and talent, climb all the way to the top. All the way to prime minister. Yeah, you don't need to be rich. You don't need to be from connected. A, yeah, connected or from a political tribe. You can start off as a volunteer who shows up and says, I'd like to volunteer at an event and then joins a local board and then becomes a writing president and then becomes a national policy leader and then becomes a member of parliament and cabinet minister. The sky's the limit. You can do that all in Canada from nowhere. And we're oh, probably- It is the most beautiful thing. I agree. And and it is something that I experienced personally. A, a guy who grew up in a, in a town of with 14 houses in it and his dad was the pastor of the little church on the corner at 23 years old, flew into Edmonton on the prime minister's plane to be picked up to go to his brother's wedding. And that was, that's, that's my, part of my Canadian story is I was at 23, a kid from nowhere flying on the prime minister's jet. And that is unique to Canada. And if more people understood it, we'd probably get more bright young people trying to do things and it would be good for our politics and our polity and in the long run, good for our country. So yeah, that's, that's what I want to leave you with. Thank you for listening to The Canadian Story. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at The CAD Story. That's The CAD Story. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with your friends and family. Let's work together to remind Canadians how great their country is.